Good morning, and welcome to Bethany Covenant Church. Thank you for being here today. We're excited you're here. I'm going to invite you to stand as we start and worship together, and I'm also going to invite any of our youth or kids that would like to help with this first song up to the stage. So if you're in the youth group, and I can see a couple of you, so I might call you out. Or if you've been in youth group and you know... Good morning, good morning. God's peace to you all, and a very warm welcome to everyone who's here. We are so glad that you're among us, and welcome also to those that are watching from home online. We're glad you're among us too. And if you're new here, or you haven't been coming very long, we truly look forward to getting to know you better. And you can pick up uh, an information packet at the counter out in the lobby that has lots of good information to help you get connected. 
I just want to say that there's room here for you, and we're so very glad you've come. In the pew in front of you, you'll find a little connection card, and you can write your prayer requests on those. You can introduce yourself. Just let us know how we can accompany you, and you can drop those connection cards in the offering bag as that comes around. Just a few announcements this morning. This coming Saturday, there are two events to know about. One is the memorial service for Elma Johnson. That's this coming Saturday at 1 o'clock. And it might not be live streamed, so we do encourage you to come in person for that. And then on Saturday, we invite you to come back at 7 o'clock for the Tulip Festival concert. All the choirs are really here, and the kids will be bringing you some beautiful music. So come on Saturday at 7 o'clock for that free concert. Also for kids, we've got a movie night coming up on Friday, April 19. We have Veggie Tales for preschool age and up. You can bring some comfy chairs and some snacks to share. And there will also be a game time for grades four to six in the youth room. So we hope to see all of our regular Bethany kids here, plus all the kids that you invite and bring with you. That's Friday, April 19 at 7 o'clock p.m. Pastor Brad is inviting us all to a church-wide book study, and the book is called The Art of Neighboring. You might have seen the table out there in the lobby. As we think about how can we be a greater presence right here on 18th Street, and also get inspired about how we can love and get to know people who live around us in our individual homes. So if you are in a home group or any kind of small fellowship, we encourage you to read through the book together. And Brad is also offering a small group study on Sunday mornings that starts April 21 during the Sunday school hour. But there are only 12 spots available for that. And I think some of them are already filled up. So you can sign up for that at the table in the lobby. If you don't have a home group or other fellowship group, you can jump in with Brad on Sunday mornings. And if you would like to join a home group here at Bethany and you don't have one, we can help you with that. So just notify the church office if you're interested in that. Many of you know that here at Bethany we have a one parish, one prisoner team or OPOP team here at Bethany. And they and we have been supporting a man named Ruben who's currently in prison and he'll be hopefully released soon. And the team has been supporting him through letters and visits, and with the help of underground ministries, they've been planning the other support that he'll need when he's released. So the OPOP team is going to have a fundraising lunch here on Sunday, April 21 at noon. The cost is $10 a person or $25 a family, plus any other amount that you want to donate toward that cause. And there will be a dessert dash at that event with all kinds of special desserts that you can bid on. And I believe there is a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk for that. It would help if you'd let us know if you're coming so they know how much food to prepare. On the same day, April 21, we're going to have a small service of healing prayer at 3 o'clock for anyone who has physical or emotional or spiritual needs. It'll just be a very small and simple service, but a time to come, hear some scriptures of healing, sing a little, and then receive prayer. And I want to encourage you not to think that someone else's needs are bigger or more important than your own. If you need prayer for anything, please do come, and we will pray for you. Sunday, April 21 at 3 o'clock p.m. And finally, I would just like to welcome Bob and Gracie Ekblad and Anna and James and Lisa, who have come from Tierra Nueva. Bob and Gracie are the longtime founders and directors of Tierra Nueva. It's a ministry here in our valley to immigrant farm workers, people without homes, and people struggling with substance use disorder. And Bob is going to be bringing us the message today, and I promise it will be rich and a real treat. And Bob has spent many, many years thinking about and studying about Jesus as the friend of sinners, and we're just so glad to have them here. They've been ministering all around the world. They train pastors and lay workers in small villages and large cities to shepherd people in knowing Jesus in a deeper way and how to minister among the poor and the outsider. And so we just welcome you, Bob and Gracie, and your Tierra Nueva crew. Can we just give them a welcome? <laughs> After the service today, Bob and Gracie will be at the prayer station, and so we welcome you to come and, and receive prayer from Bob and Gracie if you feel like you need prayer today. 
And that's all I have. And so now let's stand and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. All right, let's make our way back to our seats. And would you please remain standing and hear our call to worship today. Call to worship is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, <clears throat> and do not forget any of God's benefits, who pardons all our guilt, who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit, who crowns us with favor and compassion, who satisfies our years with good things so our youth is renewed like the eagle. Let's pray. Jesus, you walk among us. By your Holy Spirit, you are here we follow you even as we cry out, have mercy upon us. You hear, you turn, you speak to us, you touch us and heal us. When all the world rushes on, you stop for us. Terry here among us, we pray. You're welcome here. We love you. We need you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 32. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into a house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone is amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous. I have come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord.
Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for the truth of that song, for the scriptural truth of it, that you delight in showing mercy and mercy triumphs over judgment. Lord, as we come to your table today, we, we confess that we're sinners and that we fall short of your best for our lives. And we also confess, Lord, our gratefulness that you are a friend to sinners. You don't wait for us to clean up our act before we come to you, before you embrace us, before you touch us and make us whole. We are great, deeply grateful, Lord, for what you've done for us in redeeming us, in receiving us, in loving us while we are still sinners. Lord, I think about how that's modeled by this ministry in our community, Tierra Nueva, not just in our community, but um, internationally, the work that they do. And I, I thank you, Lord, for, for the work of Tierra Nueva and the work that they do with um, marginalized people, the way that they... Um, Proclaim the good news of your kingdom to the oppressed, with the oppressed, and that your good news doesn't just limit itself to a message, but to action, to healing, to liberation, to transformation, to freedom to discipleship, to advocacy. We thank you for this work that you do in and through Tierra Nueva. We thank you for Bob and Gracie Ekblad and, and their leadership of, of that ministry for all these years. We pray for your blessing for them. We pray for your provision for them. We pray that um, your kingdom's work would spread through them and that there would continue to be this amazing harvest of freedom, of, of discipleship, of people knowing you and following you and be set free and healed by you, Lord. Lord, we think of all in our congregation who need your healing touch today and we lift them up to you. We think of all who are lonely today all who are grieving, all who need your touch on their mind and heart. And we think of all of us who are sinners and need your grace. We acknowledge your work in our lives and in our kingdom and in the church around the world as we pray the prayer that thousands and thousands of Christians are praying today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I'd like to invite the ushers forward now to receive our tithes and offerings. This is the first Sunday of the month, so in addition to our regular tithes and offerings, we're collecting um, to, for the Diaconate um, Benevolence Fund today. If you would like to give towards um, this fund, it helps our deacons to um, be able to practically serve people in our community when um, one-time emergency needs come up. Like, the need for um, emergency repairs, 
um, a meal for a family who um, needs a special holiday meal or an electric bill, things like that. So thank you for um, resourcing them so that they can be a blessing to those in our community. Um, and you can put that in this envelope or there's a drop down online that you can use. Please hear these words from the book of Hebrews. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Gracious God, thank you for your word that reminds us that you are pleased with our simple sacrifices, those of doing good and sharing what you've given us with others. As we bring our offering today, may you bless these gifts and multiply them for the work of your kingdom. May the ripples of this kingdom work reach far beyond our walls to encounter those who find themselves on the margins of society, those who have not heard the good news, and those who need a special touch from you. Amen. God bless you as you give today.
good. I love to see your smiling faces. Sit down in front of me, would you please? You know what? It's my favorite thing of the week to come on Sundays to worship the Lord. But you know what else I like when I'm worshiping? I just love to be with all these people. You and all of these people are my forever family. I'll be with you forever, all of us who love Jesus, right? Look out at them. They're your aunts and uncles and cousins and grandmas and all of them. We're together here praising the Lord. But you know what? We can't be here every Sunday, can we? I mean, not, we can be here every Sunday, but not every day of the week. We've got some things to do other than come to church. But we, what did you say? Right, <laughs> we could. But do you know what? Today in the sermon, we'll hear how Jesus didn't just stay with his friends in the house or in the synagogue every day. Went and sat and had dinner with sinners, tax collectors, because he wanted all of them to become a part of the family of God. And that's the same with us. You know that Jesus told all of us, told the disciples and all of us, right before he went to heaven, he says, Go into all the world and tell them about me. Preach the gospel. Shall we? get a plane to China, and you come with me, and we'll hop over to China and tell them about Jesus. Maybe we can go to Africa. But is there, are there people who don't know Jesus in Skagit County, right where we live? Well, what can you do? How can, how can you tell? What can you do? Okay, but where will you go? You'll go around the whole world. Where, when you're young, you can't just go around the whole world. Can you go to your school? Can't, what do you say? You could go to your school and tell them to come here to church? Yes. Do you have kids in the neighborhood or maybe even grown-ups, maybe even a grandpa or grandma down the street who you could tell about Jesus? But do you know what? It's really important that we show love to people. Like, if you're in school and you're, you see somebody, maybe one child who doesn't have a friend, who is very lonely, you know, the first thing you could do is not just grab them and say, you need Jesus, but you could become his friend or her friend. You could help her not to be so lonely. You could show her kindness and compassion. And then, you know what? Maybe then later you could say, would you like to come to church with me or youth group? Or you could just tell her or him about Jesus. But it's, it's really important that all of us go into all the world, go into Skagit County, go next door to our neighbor, treat your do something special for somebody down the street. So before we pray, remember that you'll be going to plug in afterwards or to maybe back to your seat. But what I'd like you to remember is to ask Jesus how you can share the love of Jesus to your neighbors or your kids at school or whoever. Okay? Would you pray with me now? Okay, let's pray, honey. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for bringing us here to worship today. We thank you for your love and compassion that you can show through us to all the world, to Skagit County, to our school friends, to our neighbors. Help us to be witnesses for you. And just go with us for this day, we pray, and for this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Wow, Sharon, you, you gave my message. It's amazing to uh, see Sharon Benson and to remember that all of our children went through her, her school at Benson Farmstead. So anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Gracie and I, we, uh, we both grew up in the Covenant Church, you know, Mercer Island Covenant, so this is very familiar for us and uh, yet very foreign because we've been sort of out and about for a long time. So anyway, I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, Tierra Nueva before I launch into my message. Um, we've been now 30 years here in Skagit County this summer and uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, we, um, you know, we, our ministry is really, has always been outreach focused. You know, we started by um, going out into the fields and meeting farm workers and migrant camps and more recently, we, um, since COVID, a lot of our work has been going out into parks and having Bible studies. So we started a Bible study right when COVID started out of our car windows in uh, Edgewater Park. And then we moved it to um, the boardwalk in downtown Mount Vernon. And then we moved it down um, further north to, uh, or upriver, I guess, to Lions Park, where we, where we meet um, most of the year. And so this is uh, what we try to do is bring... Um, I guess the message to where people are. And um, so every week it's a little bit of a different crowd sometimes, but there's a repetition. And then um, when winter starts, when it gets cold, we've been going out on the streets and we carry backpacks with, uh, you know, with uh, like hot drinks, um, hot chocolate and, and cider and cup of soups and Narcan and, uh, you know, socks and gloves and different things. And we, um, and we also just park our car right down at the Dollar Tree or we were doing it in front of Safeway and we go out and we reach out to people on the streets and uh, mostly people that are using fentanyl now. So, uh, and then we go out in the farm worker fields as well, which we did last week. We went out and um, served people hot drinks during their break and, um, and just prayed for them. You know, the people that were out in the, in the fields, um, you know, working for Washington Bulb. And then, but our focus really is making disciples. And so we want to bring people to that point where they can choose, you know, to follow Jesus and to give their lives and to enter into a commitment through beginning with baptism. And, uh, and it's been exciting to see people coming out of the woodwork um, and into our ministry. We have a church that meets every Sunday at 4.30. And um, we have been surprised, you know, like I, one of the other things that happened uh, in the beginning is I got asked by a board that was mainly made up of Bethany Covenant people to be the chaplain of Skagit County Jail. So for a long time, I've uh, been gone into the jail and we've trained a lot of people to go with us. And, um, but then we've been blocked since COVID and we haven't been allowed back in, um, only through the glass in the attorney booths when there's space available. But uh, all those years have uh, put us into contact with thousands of people and um, and we, we run into them all the time. And um, a lot of them are showing up uh, 25 years after we first met them and then saying, hey, I'm done. I'm done with prison. I'm done with everything, my, the old life. I, I'm tired. Um, and a lot of them are people like in their early 40s. And so we have a, a lot of people at that age, group, at age level in our church with their kids and the grandkids. A lot of our people who are 40, most of them have grandkids. So... Um, unlike us who are, you know, way behind, Gracie and I. So, you know, what we're trying to do is like train the people themselves to be the carriers of the good news. And um, so we have a worship, you know, every Sunday. And um, unfortunately or sadly, or maybe not sadly, we don't have a worship team very much, uh, very often, maybe once a month. We just use YouTube because we, we've lost all of our musicians. But so if anyone wants to volunteer, let us know. But um, we have beautiful times of gatherings, and um, this was our Christmas Eve service. And, um, you know, we're preaching the message of, of the liberating gospel, and we have communion every Sunday, and then also we um, have a meal most Sundays after, after the service. And it's um, a lot of the people we work with are people, you know, who've gone through just a huge amount of suffering, a huge amount of trauma. And... Um, and it's, uh, it's just beautiful to get to know these people over years and to see them choose life, um, 
you know, um, eventually, and having to do it over and over again. Because death is a continual threat. You know, one of the things that's just been so hard for us is to see all the people um, who have died of fentanyl uh, from the overdose, you know, the pandemic of, of fentanyl in our, in our county. And one of the things we've done is we've been offering memorial services for um, people who've died of overdose deaths or, or other, you know, like tragic accidents or, or, you know, even people that have been murdered. And, and so Tierra Nueva is a place that welcomes um, and hosts gatherings for people in our community who often have no other place, no other church. Um, so um, anyway, we are enjoying being um, the body of Christ and seeing, I, I guess, people grow in their faith and become you know, more serious, committed believers. So that's our objective, is actually to raise up people and to walk alongside them and to let them raise us up as well, because we learned so much from our people. And, um, you know, we see people really um, stepping forward. And most of our people have no Christian background, so they don't need um, to be re-educated about faith. They're, um, you know, they, they are just brand new um, and to, to everything. And so, um, anyway, a lot of what we've learned over the years, we've um, we brought out into the, out to, all over the world, actually. We, we have a thing called the People's Seminary, some of you maybe have heard of, and we've done trainings um, you know, everywhere, like not everywhere. We've done, um, we have a thing called a Certificate in Transformational Ministry at the Margins, which is three four-day trainings, which we've now done in 19 different countries. So we just came back from Zambia, where we had 250 people graduate, and then also uh, South Africa. And so that's something where we're able to see that even little old Skagit County with our jail, out of that jail, more uh, sort of a, uh, like material, we've developed all these materials that we find are usable everywhere, and or the people themselves, they find them, that the message that they are uh, receiving is is good news to them um, in Ethiopia, in, uh, in Morocco, in uh, Paris, you know, all over the place. And uh, so we just went with a team of, of nine others, uh, trainers that were equipping to offer this message, you know, the whole course um, in other countries. So we have new trainings uh, that are underway in Bur uh, Burundi, Malawi, um, and um, Lesotho, and uh, we'll see where else. So a lot of what we're doing is getting people to read the Bible and to interpret it carefully in, in light of their own lives. And, um, and that is um, something that takes deliberation. It's not something that's automatic, uh, especially in Africa. People are used to being preached to, but not really uh, being in a conversational, dialogical setting where they can discover for themselves the message. So um, anyway, these are some of our people. I, it's hard to not put in all kinds of photos, and I've got everyone's permission whose photos here, by the way. This is a guy who is um, just really has touched my heart. Um, it's a message, um, a, a good testimony that I want to share briefly. This guy we met in Edgewater Park. Well, actually, I met him in the jail probably 28 years ago. but. Um, back when in COVID, we met him, he walked past with his girlfriend, our Bible study, and then came over and said, hey, can you pray for us? And I prayed for him and he was just desperate. He was living in the woods before uh, the homeless camp uh, flooded across, uh, you know, from downtown Mount Vernon. And um, so then a couple weeks later, he shows up like this, totally high on fentanyl. And he says, can you pray for me? Um, I'm just desperate. And I said, yes. And so I prayed for him. And then he just disappeared. I, I didn't know where, where he went. And I was expecting to hear that he passed away. But then I get a call three months later from a, a treatment facility in Eastern Washington. And he says, hey, I just wanted to let you know I am, um, I'm leading Bible studies, just like the ones in the jail that we did. Everything that I learned in the jail all those years, you know, I'm putting it into practice. And I'm like, seriously? Wow, that is amazing. And anyway, he's been two and a half years clean, and he now works at the Recovery Cafe, a guy named uh, Ernest. And uh, so, you know, to me, that's, uh, I'm so grateful for New Earth Recovery and the beautiful work that those guys do. Um, Ernest didn't benefit from that. He went through our drug court, but so many people ha are finding, uh, are rebuilding their lives through the careful, sensitive, tender work that New Earth Recovery is doing that I know you all support. 
So I want to talk about um, Jesus' call in um, Brad asked me to talk about it from Luke's gospel, which um, I'm kind of more excited about Matthew's version of it. So I'm going to try to do both a little bit. <laughs> but um, Levi, you know, um, according to Luke's gospel, um, I'm just going to read because I can't read it from here for some reason. Um, I'll read it from my Bible. Luke chapter um, 5. After that, he went out and he noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind, and he got up, and he began to follow him. So one of the things that strikes me right from the start is that Jesus um, got up, and he went out, okay? Um, that verb right there is a very deliberate um, action verb, and according to Mark's gospel, Jesus was in his house when um, the roof was uh, opened up and the paralytic was lowered down in front of him. And so Jesus um, went out from his house um, and he went out and came into, um, out into the public realm where he saw this guy named Levi. And, um, and Levi's identity is, is emphasized in a particular way by Luke in a way um, that, that actually, um, you know, somewhat bothers me um, because he's called um, a, a tax collector right from the start. He's, there's a label that's put on him. Um, and, um, but I think one of the things that's interesting about, about that is that this guy would have been considered to be, or by the Pharisees, to be someone who was totally lost. Um, and his name um, is the same name as the tribe that was consecrated to God as the priestly tribe, right? Um, yet he has been um, exercising an unclean profession in collaboration with the occupying Romans. And so, um, so therefore he was a notorious sinner. And who would be the equivalents of Levi for us in our county now? You know, um, who would be the tax collectors of Skagit County? Um, um, first on my list would be the county assessors. Um, you know, um, since I went and tried to get my property taxes lowered and they wouldn't do it. Um, and, but, you know, identifying tax collectors really depends on your perspective. You know, people in our jails would say they're, uh, you know, they're uh, bounty hunters who work for the county, you know, the Department of Corrections, or they're, or they're the police, or the Sheriff's Department deputies, or, you know, or whatever. Um, you know, but um, we could identify them perhaps as people that work for the Mexican drug cartels, and we have a lot of people like that in our county who, who work for the cartels and they sell drugs. Uh, maybe not directly, but indirectly for the cartels. And so there's, you know, we don't, we want to be careful not to be just judgmental about who we identify as tax collectors and sinners. But I think it's a, it's a category that includes anyone that you might um, cancel. Okay, so think about who you would cancel. Maybe it's the Republicans. Maybe they'd be the Democrats. Okay, um, so uh, maybe they'd be felons or, or maybe they'd be... Um, you know, your next door neighbor or a family member. So, uh, but Jesus sees this tax collector. And um, I love the language that's used here because the word is um, uh, theaomai. Theaomai is a word that means um, something quite unique in the Gospels. And it's um, come from, from the, um, the name for God, Theos. So it's, uh, it's a way of seeing that is a God-given way of seeing. So it's like, uh, Jesus saw Levi in a very unique way where he saw into him um, and saw his depths and uh, saw him um, in a divine way. And of course, we want to be seen in that way, don't we? We don't want to be judged. Um, you know, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. But Jesus is modeling um, going out and, and seeing uh, somebody differently than the way the world would have seen him. Because what does Jesus do? He says, follow me. Okay, and immediately Levi um, leaves everything and he follows him. And um, I'm going to return to that in a second. But um, I want to um, continue on and look a little bit at, at Matthew's version of this. Let's see if this works. Let's see. So... Um, When Jesus calls Matthew, it's, it's a little bit different. 
And I'm going to read it again from my Bible since I can't see far that far away. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. This is probably the text that I use more often than any to introduce um, the gospel to people who are uh, you know, involved in criminal activities. And, uh, so in prisons, I've done Bible studies on this many times. Um, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Now, in Matthew's gospel, it's, uh, it's quite beautiful, the language that's used here. It's a different language. It's, um, the language is, uh, let's see, Jesus is seeing is the word horao, um, you know, in the Greek. And I'm going to read something from Philemon of Gaza. Philemon of Gaza was a 6th century monk who lived in Gaza, who his role was to train up new novitiates, who were people becoming monks, and he was the doorman for this, uh, for this uh, monastery. And we publish uh, a lot of different books that we find expe especially excellent. Um, this was translated from the French, and we published it. And we have some of these out there, but I just want to read from um, Philemon of Gaza how he reviews Matthew. Jesus saw a man. Matthew tells us, this is magnificent. If everything began for Matthew with a look from Jesus fixed on him, this look is presented as the same as that, God, as that that God fixed on his creatures at the beginning of the world. In fact, Matthew picks up the verb horao used to express the way God saw his new creatures each day before he states his pleasure in their beauty. You know, when God saw that it was good, you know, he, he created this or that um, on, in Genesis 1, and he saw, and that's the same word in the Greek version of the Old Testament, horao, that it was good. Um, who did Jesus see at the tax collector's post? A man. Not a tax collector, not Levi, as the other evangelists say, but a man. Anthropos. The word which exactly designates the man created by God in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. This is wonderful. Not only did Matthew see Jesus as his father, but also as God, his creator. What a lesson, again, for me. This exhorts me to hold on to the way Jesus has his eyes fixed on the depths of my heart. Not to see the sinner that I am, but the created being, good, indeed, very good. So what does this look like for us? Um, you know, I, I really um, have was very reluctant to ever start a church, which we've done now at Tierra Nueva, because I always thought there were way too many churches, and I always saw Jesus as um, out there going from place to place, and I don't see any evidence that Jesus ever started a church. And so I'm like, what's up with that? You know, Christians, like, why are you so into your gathering places? Jesus um, went as a guest, not a host. Jesus was a guest, and he sent out his disciples in the same way. He said, don't take any money. Don't take any extra clothes. Don't take your cup of soups or your hot chocolate or your, or your hot water. Um, you know, go out um, just vulner in vulnerability and go out as a guest and go out, go out, go out. That's what I, that's what I heard and that's what I want to emphasize. Um, and so Jesus went out and he, um, here he sees a man. And that, um, that call to go out has been just so deeply ingrained in me from my childhood, I think. Um, and how do we go out, uh, I guess, inspired by these gospel stories and by Jesus' way of seeing? I want to see the way Jesus sees, don't you? You know, to be able to see in a way that is God-given, to be able to see in a way that sees the goodness that is truly there in people. Um, so the other day we went out last Friday and um, we were finding people um, it, it was a little hard to find people because the police were rounding up people in front of the Dollar Tree, and so, but then p new ones were coming, and so we came upon some people, and there was an older man who had a dog, and um, who I'd seen numerous times, and I said, sir, would you like um, some cup of soups or some hot chocolate or anything um, that we can serve you? And he says, oh, I'd have some cup of soups, and I said, okay, would you like hot chocolate too? Or uh, it was just one cup of soup? And he said, well, actually, I'd like two cup of soups. So I went to, the, to our car, and I prepared with James here, um, and Gracie, 
couple of uh, these cup of soups, and and I just looked over at the guy, um, and I, you know, when James gave them to me, um, I held them, and I thought, you know, how am I going to address this guy? And I just, as I started to walk towards him, I just felt like God said, call him your excellency. And I thought, that seems kind of weird. Um, but um, I, can't, I walked towards him, and I just looked up at him, and I said, sir, your excellency. And he just, his, his head just jolted back. He was um, very moved, and, um, and I was very moved, because I realized God had given me um, a, a, a way of seeing him that I believe was truly the way um, our Father in Heaven sees, sees him. Um, and, you know, and he, he received, and, uh, and I received the, the message that, um, that deeply moved me. So um, Jesus um, models something that inspires us. Um, so I just talked to you about how, um, how Jesus um, saw this guy as a man, and how do we see people as in their beloved child of God status? Uh, Sunday after that, we were ready to leave, and then we thought, no, let's go over to Safeway. There's maybe somebody else we can find. And so we went over there, and we saw a couple of people in the parking lot, and we pulled off, pulled over, and I walked up to them. And I said, hey, you guys, do um, you, you need something hot to drink? And this guy looks at me, and he goes, Bob? And I was like, um, he goes, I'm Jason. And I'm like, Jason? That is crazy. How in the world... You're alive. I, I didn't know what happened to you. It's been like 20 years, 15 years. I mean, this is a guy that I knew from the jail. Um, and he reminded me of that over and over. And he says, yeah, you'd come in and pray for me. And, um, you know, I just got out of uh, 24 years in prison. And uh, anyway, I just, uh, Gracie and I ministered to him and prayed for him and prayed for his partner. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was amazing. I, I, I don't know if he's going to show up at, at Tierra Nueva. He might. I wouldn't be surprised, actually. But it's like our county has so many people that are out and about who are just uh, beautiful people who are, who are caught up in, uh, in hardship. You know, behind um, um, the Dollar Tree, um, behind the, uh, what's the name of the place next to the Dollar Tree? Hobby Lobby. Behind Lobby, Hobby Lobby, we found a lady Friday night who was huddled underneath her carts her cart and with a plastic tarp over her. We didn't know there was anyone under there, but we pulled up and said, hey, is, are, you, are you okay under there? And this lady pulls back the drape and, um, and we see her and um, we offered her um, a sweater and, uh, and found one actually that fit her just perfectly. And she told us about how she'd been homeless since COVID when her, her, her house burned down upriver. And, that, uh, and she, we said, well, would you, like, would you like prayer? And she says, yeah, I'd like prayer for my, my, my kids. And, um, and she said, they, they don't know where I am. Um, they don't know that I'm out here. And I don't want them to know that I'm out here. I, I just want to get into treatment. And so we prayed for her. And it was, it was so, so precious. Um, so... Um, So one of the things we see when God called Matthew is that he left everything. And leaving everything is, um, is, is emphasized in a particular way in Matthew's gospel, where it, it looks like he's, he's not just leaving it, but he's renouncing it. You know, he's, um, he's completely uh, leaving that old life, and he's, uh, he's so compelled by the word of God. Um, you know, I, I believe these stories are meant for us to read, thinking of ourselves as being... Um, it's being called to be like Jesus, not just looking at Jesus as the only one that can do this, but Jesus is modeling a way of being an agent of call where uh, we are armed with the powerful word of God. And when the word of God speaks through us, it has the power to, to speak light into darkness. It has the power to bring the dead um, out of their tombs. It has the power to bring the lame um, make the lame stand up straight. It has the same power that Jesus' words had when he healed people, when he, when he told the lame man, take up your pallet and walk. Um, and we, we need to be able to tune into that, um, the powerful word of God and, um, and know how to articulate that because we're not inviting people to follow us, right? We're inviting them to follow Jesus. 
You know, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus ends his message by saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go, make disciples of all the nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to practice everything that I've commanded you. And I will be with you always. So Jesus calls us to make disciples of him. Okay, so this is a... a a tricky thing because we are the embodiment of Jesus. We're the body of Christ. And so in a way, we are inviting them to follow us. And, um, but what's interesting, one time I was in Guatemala and we were invited into a maximum security prison where uh, the guards weren't even going in because they beheaded the, the head of the prison like a month before. And, uh, but there was a jail ministry that had favor with all the inmates. And it was a notorious uh, gang called the MS-13. And so we were able to go in, and I was invited to, to offer the first Bible studies that had ever been offered in this prison, um, at least in, in, in recent times. So I went in, and God had given me a vision um, three nights before in the United States, here in Skagit County, of a man with a big hole in his side and tattoos all over his chest. And I came into this prison, and um, the first two people I met are a guy named Psycho and a guy named Shark, and they were the heads of this gang. And I realized suddenly I, I needed to use the bathroom. Um, maybe I was kind of nervous or something. I don't know. But right then I saw that this guy named Shark had a big hole in his side. And um, for me, this is the biggest equivalent of the Matthew, the call of Matthew story. Um, so Shark said, I'll take you there. Yo le voy a llevar. And so I followed him back into the prison and praying in the spirit the whole time, you know, Holy Spirit, you know, help me, save me, you know, deliver me. Rescue me, you know, bless me, show me what to say to this guy. So I, I get out of the bathroom and he says, Quiere ver mi casa? You want to see my cell? And so I said, Yeah. So I went in and he had this heavy duty, uh, really violent rap music going on. And I start talking to him. I found out he's doing a 140 year sentence, you know, um, and he's the official president of this gang. And, uh, and I said, You know, um, I had a dream and I told him about my dream and I said, I, I've been looking for this person with a hole in their side and you're the first person that fits the description. Whatever happened? And he goes, oh, I was shot up by the police and I was hospitalized for, for months and almost died. And I said, well, I had this dream about you and I don't know why, but you know, you know that I'm a pastor and pastors do things like pray for people. Um, would you want prayer for anything? Um, and he says, well, yeah. I said, well, okay. So, um, and then I remembered I had this music that I brought in, a little uh, CD back then. And, um, and I thought, oh, I'll give him this gift of the CD. I didn't even know what kind of worship music it was. And so I give it to him. And so he immediately takes his uh, rap music off and he puts this CD on. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. The rap music's cool. And he goes, no, it's mas correcto. So he puts on this music and this contemplative flute music kind of invades his cell. <laughs> and so I'm like, Okay, let's pray. So we pray for him. Um, and I pray for him. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit like came in power. This guy, uh, I could just feel like burning all over my, my, my whole being. And he was feeling it too. And I prayed for his son and his family. And um, when we finished, I just said, you know, um, did you feel that presence of God? He goes, um, well, I didn't say presence of God. Did you feel that? He goes, yeah. He said, it feels so peaceful. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's the presence of Jesus, like invisible to Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And, you know, um, that just shows you and me right now that he loves to be here with you. And, um, and you know, he doesn't want to leave when I leave. And uh, he'd be glad to stay with you if you'd like that. And he goes, I would like that. And I said, well, I mean, he can not only stay in your cell, but he can like stay right inside of you if you welcomed him and just said, you know, you want him to be with you and to come inside of you. And he says, si, yo quiero. Yes, I want that. So I prayed for him. And then we realized we had to get to the Bible study. And so um, we left. And uh, because he was the top guy, everyone came to this Bible study. And we were doing it on Matthew, the tax collector. And God had, uh, I'd been struggling because I'd been told that the gang was uh, very hostile towards Christians because Christians were saying to be a Christian, you had to leave the gang. And, um, and so they were threatening to, you know, to even kill gang members that would leave the gang to become Christians. 
because a lot of them saw the church as just gangs, rival gangs, and which in some ways as they were um, in Guatemala, and maybe they are still. And so anyway, um, I was just thinking, God, what do I, how do I deal with this? Because I do think people need to leave the, their criminal lifestyle and leave the gang. And so God showed me in this scripture, this very scripture that we're looking at, um, something really super powerful. Like when Matthew follows Jesus, um, where do they go? They go to Matthew's house. So, so I, I brought this up. I said, so let's just check it out, you guys. Jesus, um, he calls Matthew. And um, who are the tax collectors in, in Guatemala right now? And they were all like, we are. Because that's what they do. They collect taxes. They say, you know, we'll protect you from ourselves if you give us this much money. And if you don't, we're going to kill you, right? That's kind of how they operate. So they were clearly like the, the equivalent of a tax collectors. So anyway, I said, so Jesus comes. And does he call Matthew to leave his gang? And everyone was like silent and freaking out that I was going to tell them the bad news that was going to get me in trouble and make it impossible for them. And they said, um, they were silent. And I said, let's see what happens. And so uh, we read the next uh, part about how um, Jesus, um, you know, what does he do? He goes um, and he eats with all these tax collectors and sinners. He reclines at the table with them. And, um, and so I said, so who followed whom into um, and everyone could see that Jesus followed Matthew into his gang. And so I turned to Psycho and I said, Psycho, if Jesus came to Guatemala, would you let him be a member of the MS-13? And when I said that, Shark just burst out laughing. Okay. And he was like, ah, ha, 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 that's crazy. Está loco. And so Shark, I mean, Psycho said, yeah, I'd, I'd, I would. And I said, well, would the religious leaders be happy with you? Uh, or Jesus, would they be glad that, that Jesus joined the MS-13? And, um, and everyone was like, oh, they'd be so upset, and the government would be so upset. And uh, I said, okay. And so God gave me the key to understand that text. So just in summary, um, so Jesus models God's action. He goes um, out, out of his home into the public. He's not the host but a guest, right? Um, he notices someone that religious people would judge. Um, he sees him, that he's a man made in God's image, who's called Matthew. Um, he calls him, follow me. Jesus then follows Matthew to his house. Okay, so what does that look like for us? You know, for us, it, it looks like going out to where people are. And, um, and that might be the fields, um, like we've been doing to some extent, uh, more lately, uh, or maybe it's Costco, okay? Um, you know, Gracie has a special ministry at um, the Skagit Valley Food Co-op where she knows so many of the people by name. Um, you know, um, Anna has a special ministry at Riverside Health Club where she knows lots and lots of people. Um, recently, we were at Costco and I just decided to follow Gracie in to, and I thought, well, I'll just go and I'll pray. And I'm walking along praying and just thinking, God, do you have an encounter for me with somebody? And I ran straight into this Korean couple who he'd been a prison chaplain. And um, I knew him. He was a student of mine at Regent. And uh, now he's going to come down and join us on one of our outreaches. So it's like God has encounters for all of us uh, everywhere. And I like that you guys are focusing on, um, you know, on being neighbors. But one thing to notice is uh, there's some other things. His next action um, is that he's... He's reclining at the house with all these people, eating with them, right? Being neighborly, receiving their hospitality. But, um, but then we see that there's, uh, and we see Mark's gospel adds something that he says there were many tax collectors and sinners that were with him because there were many that were following him. And you'd think that that would make everybody happy, right? The religious people would think, you know, God called Abraham to be a blessing to all the families of the earth and here it's happening. But no, um, the religious leaders were not happy. Um, they said, why? Um, they come to the t uh, disciples of Jesus. Why is your uh, master eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why? You know, why is he, uh, is he endorsing these people's behavior? Is he, is he saying that he's fine with it? Is he, uh, you know, is he just blessing uh, bad people's bad actions? I mean, what's up with, with you, Jesus, with your Jesus? Um, they clearly weren't excited about it. And... 
So Jesus responds in two different ways that I want to just quickly go through. Uh, first of all, he says, um, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are, um, who are sick, right? So he identifies his role then as being a physician. He's not just a friend. He's not just there to be an equal among uh, people on, on, on the margins that he's with. He's there actually to bring uh, an, uh, the healing power of God that he embodies. Okay, and this is something we need to remember. We're not just out, um, sent out to just make friends and just to be social, okay? Like we are actually called out to, be, to bear witness and to be very deliberately uh, carriers of, of a liberating message. Okay, and of course we wanna do it in a super sensitive way that comes out of high respect and honor for people and listening to them and knowing, their, knowing about them and their story. Okay, but we don't wanna just stop there. It's not just about being a, a, a humble, uh, respectful presence. It's also about knowing that there's healing that's needed in the world. And we have uh, the name of Jesus as our weapon and the word of God that's the sword of the spirit, don't we? So that's the first thing he says. Um, so um, secondly, he, uh, he says, but go and learn. Jesus actually dismisses um, his, uh, these people who are judging. He says, you know, go, get out of here, leave. You're not safe for my people. You know, we're in a tender space here with tax collectors and sinners. And so, you know, um, you guys, he shows them the door. That's how I read this, okay? Jesus is, is, is pretty harsh when it comes to this attitude of judging, right? He says, go and learn. He doesn't close the door to them. He, he tells them, go and learn uh, what this means. I desire uh, mercy and not sacrifice, right? And so Jesus gives them a homework assignment. And he, because he cares about them too. He cares about us when we're in that space of, of being on the throne of, of judgment. He doesn't want us to be like that. He invites us to come to him. Um, he says, come and learn from me for my yoke is easy. For I am humble of heart, right? And, and my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Um, God desires compassion and that's what we need to be about. So finally, um, Jesus uh, also then emphasizes that he's not just about being an agent of healing, but he is also a, an agent of call. And he tells uh, his listeners, um, these Pharisees, look, I haven't come to call the righteous, uh, which is why I'm out there with the tax collectors and sinners. You know, I haven't come to call the righteous. I have come to call sinners. And, um, and so do we see ourselves that way? Do we see ourselves as agents of healing and as agents of call? You know, where uh, through us, uh, God could speak a word um, that would invite someone to to leave everything potentially and to follow Jesus. And um, just so I wanna just wrap this up with um, what does this look like for us? So what this looks like for us from my perspective is Jesus models us going out as guests, not as hosts, like I've said. And um, Jesus notices and he sees in a way that is honoring of people, doesn't he? Um, Jesus goes to people rejected by religious people, you know, the tax collectors and the sinners. Um, so we need to identify who those might be for our, in our own county. Jesus follows them where they are. So he continues this host, um, you know, posture of being a, I mean, guest posture. He continues to be a guest. He's conscious of his role as physician and he's, uh, he recognizes that this involves showing mercy. And he's also, confronting um, the naysayers in a really deliberate way that I think would have made all those tax collectors and sinners feel comforted and supported and like he was on their side. And he uh, forefronts his activity to call making disciples. So let's pray. So God, I just ask that you would help us to, uh, to really take this story to heart. I ask that you would help us to... Uh, to step up and be willing to go out of our comfort zone. I ask that you would uh, remind us that we carry your liberating word as uh, that saves and that frees. And I ask that, um, that you would mobilize us 
to, be, to bear witness and that we would see uh, many more people in our county um, come to find you and find their, their place at your table. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time, you can pick up your children in the lobby where they should be waiting for you or coming very shortly and return with your children here so they can participate in communion with you. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and north and south to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, we reflect on our reasons for thanksgiving and faith and our need for forgiveness and love. In this time of silence, we remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who called us to share this meal together, and we thoughtfully examine the state of our hearts as the Holy Spirit directs us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and juice, the ordinary things of the world that Christ will make holy. We, the bread we break and the cup we share may be the communion of the body and blood of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite the deacons to come forward. And in a moment, I'll invite all of you to come forward. You'll see the deacons standing at the head of certain aisles. Just come down the aisles where you see the deacons standing and then return by the other aisles. There are gluten-free packets in the baskets. And if you need one of those, just ask the server. We also have grapes for children who may not fully understand yet the significance of communion, but the grapes are a sign of God's love and promise of future understanding. If you are unable to come forward, just raise your hand and someone will come and serve you in your seat. And once you've received the elements, you can return to your seat and partake whenever you're ready. The table is ready if you would receive the invitation and the gift of Christ. 
If you feel drawn to him, if you feel your need of him, this table is for you. Please come.
Would you please stand? As you go out, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.